brothers and sisters in the faith to another episode of the Bible Question and Answer, the BQA program brought to you by the Assembly of Yahushua. Our topic for today is a follow-up of what we discussed last time, which is about hearing from God. So what prevents a person from hearing from Yahuwah or Yahushua? This is what we're going to answer, but before we go ahead and proceed, let us first offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty and gracious Abba Yahuwah, thank you so much for the blessings that we have received as we call upon your name, Yahuwah, and meditate upon its meaning, how it reflects your character and who you are. We are filled with your presence, filled with confidence that you are listening to our prayers and that you are ever present with each and every one of us. Thank you so much for this gift. We promise that we will always follow you and heed your voice in our life. Our King Yahushua, may you strengthen the faith of your people as we study these words that we're going to be looking into. May you speak to our hearts and strengthen us that we may be obedient to your voice and the voice of our Father. Oh, Father, please cleanse us and forgive us all our sins, for we ask and beg everything. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, praises be to our loving Father that we are again given this precious opportunity to study His words and His commands. Our topic for today is what prevents us uh, from hearing God. Now, before we go ahead and straight to the question at hand, I would like to first ask you this question. How would your life change? How would your life be? If Yahuwah and Yahusha regularly speaks to you, what would happen to your life? I think we would live a joyful way of life, right? Even if we have to go through suffering, whether it be sickness or hardship, just like the apostles and the prophets, because all of them went through difficult times. But the one thing that gave them consolation and joy, despite all of what was happening in their life, is the fact that they had this communication with who? With Yahuwah. You see, when Yahuwah speaks to us, and we know he is speaking to us, that he's concerned about our life, the result is we are filled with joy. We are filled with peace that surpasses all understanding. This is why we need to remove all hindrances so that we can be sure God speaks to us and guides us as we go about our life. Well, how can we hear from God anyways? Does God really speak to us even during our time today? Well, we know we studied in our last episode of the BQA about how God communicates and speaks to us today. 
And we know that it's through the Bible as guided by the Holy Spirit. This is how we can hear from him through worship services and Bible studies that are led by the Spirit, through godly people who are led by the Spirit, through spiritual dreams and visions, and through whispering in our ears when Yahuwah God speaks directly to our souls and our hearts and somehow, some way, it kind of sounds audible. Sometimes that happens, perhaps it's not all of the time, but we know Yahuwah God speaks to us in different ways. And when you can look, when you look at this uh, uh, the screen, we know that the common denominator is the Holy Spirit. So Yahuwah God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. And so when we study the Bible, for example, we kind of get this sense, Yahuwah God wants us to focus on a certain word that is applicable to a situation in our life that is God speaking to us through the Holy Spirit and the Bible. Maybe we're attending a Bible study, or maybe we're sitting by uh, along the couch, or maybe we're doing something else, driving our cars. Sometimes Yahuwah God gives us a message, a thought, and we know this comes from Him because we feel the Spirit inside of us. And so when God speaks to us today, it's not with a loud voice, but a still, small voice. Where does this still, small voice come from? What is behind this dynamic? In the book of Corinthians 2, 10 to 12, but it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit, for His Spirit searches out everything and knows us and knows and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. And so the Bible tells us that Yahuwah has all these wonderful things he wants to freely give us. You see that in the passage. He wants to give this to us. He wants to give us a message. He wants to speak to us, but he speaks to us in a still, small voice. What does that mean? It means it is his spirit communicating with our spirit through our thoughts. This is why sometimes when Yahuwah God speaks to us, he plants a thought in our mind confirmed by our heart. And so it's the mind and the heart working together, being aligned with the spirit of God that allows this communication to happen. Because the Bible tells us the spirit of God knows the deep thoughts of God, right? Our spirit, our human spirit, knows the deep thoughts that we have. And so when Yahuwah wants to speak to us, it could be from his mind to our mind through the power of the Holy Spirit as confirmed in our heart. So that's the dynamic behind the still small voice. This is why we can say today God speaks to us. Yahuwah uh, communicates to us his will. But the problem is we don't often hear from him. And so what could the reason be? What prevents us from hearing God? So I want to pause this question to all of you right now. And as you look at the screen and we pose this question, what prevents us from hearing God? In actuality, we can answer that question with one word. You know what it is? What prevents us from hearing God? Short answer, ourselves. Yahuwah wants to speak to us. But because of the things we do or the things we don't do, we hinder Yahuwah God from speaking to us. And so we need to identify these hindrances that we ourselves bring up that prevents us from listening and hearing God. So what is one hindrance? That prevents us from hearing God. Let's read the book of James, chapter 4, 8 down to 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of Yahuwah, and he will lift you up. Here in the book of James, he tells us Yahuwah God wants to be near us, Right? But for us to receive Yahuwah, for Yahuwah to be near us, there's something we need to do. Bible says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. 
In other words, we need to repent. We need to humble ourselves because sin is a hindrance from hearing the voice of our Father. This is why James tells us, cleanse your hands, you sinner. So number one hindrance is the hindrance of unrepented sin. And we know why. Because sin has consequences, one of which is because of our iniquities, because of our sins. What does God do? He hides his face from us. So sin causes separation between us and God. It becomes a barrier when it comes to communication. And so when we are living in sin, when we don't want to know if we are guilty of sin, because some people live like that, right? They don't want to know about their sin. And if we don't want to know about our sin, well, we're going to live our life not repenting that sin. And if it's not repented, there's always going to be this barrier between us and God. So sin separates us from God. Sin also hardens us. Bible says, exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So the Bible tells us sin creates hardening. And when our King Yahushua was speaking to his disciples, after speaking to the Jewish authorities, he said the Jewish authorities were hardened. They hardened their ears. They hardened their hearts. They closed their eyes. And so they were not receptive. They did not realize that Yahuwah God was speaking to them through who? Yahushua, because of the hardening, the hardening effect of sin. And so we need to remove sin from our life. And so what's the solution to the hardening effect of sin? In the book of Psalm 51, 2 to 4, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your son. You will be provided right in what you say, and your judgment against, against me is just. You know who was the one who wrote this passage? It was King David. And so David, once upon a time, committed a sin, a heinous sin, adultery leading to murder. So it was really bad. And he wasn't even aware of his sin. Somebody had to call him out. Who called him out? Nathan, the prophet, had to call him out. He wasn't aware of his sin. Sometimes we can live our life like that. We commit little sins, big sins, many kinds of sins, but sometimes we're not aware. So we need to be brought to awareness of our sin. One of the things we can do is talk to the people we love, or we can pray to the Father, Yahuwah. Father, tell me about my secret sins. Tell me about the faults I am not aware of, because we need to be re recognizing and acknowledging our sins. That's the first step of repentance. But you notice, once David knew about his sin, what happened? Bible says the sin haunted him day and night. And so it creates this negative tension in us. We are concerned about sin in our life. That's another process of repentance. That's the second part of repentance. What's the third part? Bible says against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. In other words, the reason why he's tormented by sin is because he displeased Yahuwah. You know, there are people who after they commit sin, because when a person sins, sometimes they suffer the consequence of sin, right? Punishment or lose a blessing that should have been theirs. Punishment. And so what do they do? Oh, they repent. But why do they repent? It's because they lost out on a blessing. Why do they repent? Or because they are being punished. And so when you think about that, it's not really the proper motivation for repentance. True repentance is that you repent not because you missed out on the blessing or because you're being punished. True repentance is when you're haunted by your sin because you know you displeased. Yahuwah. You get it? So that's the root of true repentance. When we repent because we know our sin displeases him, Yahuwah is pleased with that because it shows humility and a love for our father, Yahuwah. Isaiah 57, 15, I am the high and holy God who lives forever. 
I live in a high and holy place, but I also live with people who are humble and repentant so that I can restore their confidence and hope. So when we properly repent with humility and contrite hearts, when our sins haunt us because we know we displease Yahuwah, Yahuwah is going to be pleased with us. And he tells us, I'm going to live in you. And if Yahuwah lives in us, then it will remove the barrier so that we can communicate with our father, Yahuwah. So that's number one, the hindrance of sin. Number two is the hindrance of an unprepared heart. Because when Yahuwah speaks to us, it speaks to us in our thoughts and our mind and also through our hearts. The heart is kind of what confirms it. So the heart is like a barometer. It kind of tells us if our thoughts is from God, from Yahuwah, or it's from somewhere else. So we need to know, we need to have a, a prepared heart. And we know in our past lesson, one of the things that hinders us from receiving uh, the voice and hearing from Yahuwah and from Yahushua is when we grieve the Holy Spirit. Because this is how Yahuwah communicates with us, through the power of his Spirit, but if we grieve the Spirit, we're hindering uh, this message, this uh, the voice of God in our heart. So, what do we need to do? We need to get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. We need to forgive each other as we have been forgiven. And so, until we are able to do this, our heart is not prepared. How else can we prepare our hearts besides unforgiveness? Besides bitterness and rage and anger dwelling in our hearts, what also kind of plugs up the heart so that we are unable to hear from God? Well, the parable of Yahusha tells us a lot. In this parable, Yahusha says, this is what the parable means. The seed is the word of God. And so the Bible tells us in one of Yahusha's parables, he's speaking about the heart and the, the soil and the seed. It's a parable. Uh, he spoke a parable about the soil and the seed. And now he's given an explanation of what the parable means. The seed is the word of God. The soil is the heart. Okay. And so one thing we want to know is that the seed is like into the word of God. And so if we want our hearts to be able to receive communication or reap the harvest of communication and guidance from our God, well, we need to plant the seeds, right? If we don't plant the seeds, we can't really prepare ourselves to receive uh, from Yahuwah. We can't prepare ourselves to receive his voice and him speaking to us. This is why it's so good and so important that we spend time to study the Bible, to read the Bible. Because when we read the Bible, when we study the Bible, and when we attend Bible studies like this, we are planting the seeds of the word of God in our heart. So that's good. Right, But in the parable of our King Yahushua, no matter what seed you plant, if the heart or the soil is not prepared, will it produce the fruit? It will not. This is why Yahushua, our King, tells us about three kinds of hearts that are not prepared to receive the word of God and so cannot receive any kind of message from him. In the book of Luke 8, 12 to 14, the seeds that fell along the path Stand for those who hear, but the devil comes and takes the message away from their hearts in order to keep them from believing and being saved. The seeds that fell on rocky ground stand for those who hear the message and receive it gladly, but it does not sink deep into them. They believe only for a while, but when a time of testing comes, they fall away. The seeds that fell among the thorn bushes stand for those who hear. But the worries and riches and pleasures of this life crowd in and choke them, and their fruit never ripens. And so our King Yahushua tells us about three kinds of hearts that are not conducive or were not produced a harvest after you plant the seeds of the Word of God. One kind of heart is when the devil comes and takes the message away. In other words, the, the Word of God doesn't even make it to the heart right why because they don't believe and so when we read our bibles beloved brethren we have to believe we read the bible not as a book that is from man to man but a book that is from god 
to man. And so when we read the word of God, we need to really believe. We need to have faith that it's the word of God. And so when we do that, we plant it in our hearts. If we don't believe, and then it's like the devil taking it away, right? And so we need to make sure in our heart we are believing. So we have a believing heart. But that's not enough. Because the Bible tells us another kind of heart is like a heart that is equivalent to rocky ground. What does this mean? When you plant the seed in rocky ground, it does not sink deep into them. And so what does this tell us? When we believe in the word of God, uh, in, in our thoughts, we need to also feel the word of God. In other words, we need to allow the word of God to create an emotional connection to us. Because sometimes a person can intellectually believe, but they're not transformed by the word of God because they don't make an emotional connection to the word of God. It doesn't inspire a, an emotional response from them. As human beings, we are emotional creatures because we have a heart, right? And so when it doesn't sink deep into our hearts, it means we haven't made an emotional connection with the word of God. So what the Bible tells us, if you want to have a good heart, number one, we need to have a believing heart. Number two, we need to have an emotional connection with the word of God. And in verse 14, another kind of heart, the Bible tells us, the seeds that fell among thorn bushes stand for those who hear, but the worries and riches and pleasures of this life crowd in and choke them, and their fruit never ripens. And so this kind of heart is like into a thorn bush. In other words, there's so much in one's heart, so much in his desires, it crowds in and chokes the word of God. In other words, yes, they make an emotional connection with the word of God. They love the word of God. They adore the word of God, right? Problem is, they also love pleasure. They also love riches. In fact, they love riches and pleasures. They have a greater emotional connection with pleasures and riches more than the word of God. And so when that happens, when your desire for riches and your desire for pleasures of life is more than your desires for the word of God, then what happens to the word of God? It gets choked out. And so the Bible tells us it's building for us. It's teaching us step by step how to create a heart that is prepared to listen to the word of God. Number one, belief. We have to have a believing heart, right? Number two, we have to make an emotional connection with the word of God. We need to love the word of God. We have an emotional feeling of joy when we study the word of God. Number three, our joy for the word of God exceeds our joy for riches and the pleasures of this life. That's how we prepare our heart. What else is indicative of a heart that is prepared according to our King Yahusha? Let's keep reading. Verse 15, the seeds that fell in good soil stands for those who hear the message and retain it in a good and obedient heart. And they persist until they bear fruit. And so what is another indication of a good heart? The Bible tells us a good heart is one that is obedient. Right? You see that? Our heart is obedient. In other words, our heart is pure. And if we were to ask you, what does it mean to have a pure heart? Because unless we plant the seed of the word of God in a pure heart, we cannot expect for Yahuwah to speak to us. And so what is a pure heart that opens the doors and removes the barriers from communicating with our Father Yahuwah? Let's go back to James 4, 8 to 10. I want you to see something here. Draw you to God and he will draw you to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. What does it say? Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so the Bible tells us how we can purify our hearts by not being double-minded. What does it mean for a person to be double-minded? Well, for example, they ask Yahuwah for a sign. Father, I want to marry this person. Or this person, I mean, I'm thinking of marrying this person. And so I'm asking you, Father, please tell me if I should marry this person or not. Right? But deep inside, they already made a decision. What they're looking for is just confirmation. And so when Yahuwah God says no, but your heart says yes, then you are 
you don't have a purified heart. You have a double mind. A double mind means sometimes you say no, sometimes you say yes. So when Yahuwah God has a message for you, you kind of debate whether or not it's good for you. If you're, all, if you're going to debate what God has for you, if you're going to debate the message God will speak to you, why will God speak to you in the first place? Right? Because sometimes when we go to a doctor and ask for his opinion and he gives us you know, some recommendations, sometimes we have a double mind, which is right, because sometimes doctors make mistakes, right? But with God, he doesn't make mistakes. And so if we're going to approach communicating with God with a double mind, meaning if he says something we don't like, we're going to not follow it, then why will God speak to us? Do you know what that's called? When we approach God with a heart that is double-minded, do you know what that's called? Let's read the book of Ezekiel 14, 1 to 3. Then some of the leaders of Israel visited me, this is Ezekiel. And while they were sitting with me, this message came to me from Yahuwah, son of man. These leaders have set up idols in their hearts. They have embraced things that will make them fall into sin. Why should I listen to their requests? And so having a double mind is like having idols in your hearts. What do these idols represent? Something that they embrace. And they embrace the things that will make them fall into sin. You see, as human beings, it's possible to have an idol in your heart. We all know about the sin of idolatry. But for many of us, when we think of idolatry, what do we think about? Statues, right? We think of uh, some, some kind of image. That's what we think of when it comes to idolatry. But the Bible tells us something deeper about idolatry, the root of idolatry. Because statues is the manifestation of idolatry, but it's not the root of idolatry. And so the Bible tells us about the root of idolatry through the teachings of the Apostle Paul. For example, in Colossians 3 verse 5, he says, covetousness, which is idolatry. And so when we covet something that Yahuwah does not want to give us, that's the root of idolatry. What else is idolatry? In Samuel, the Bible tells us, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. How is idolatry also defined? It is stubbornness. The word stubborn in Hebrew means to push back, right? And so the Bible tells us when we have something that we covet, and when Yahuwah says, you cannot covet that, it's not good for you, and then we push back with stubbornness, that is idolatry. And that's what the Bible's talking about when we have idols in our hearts. It makes us double-minded. We wait for Yahuwah's message. If we like it, okay. If we don't like it, because we have something that we covet, and then we reject it. This is why if we're going to receive a message from Yahuwah, we have to make the choice now. We have to say to the Father, whatever your will is, whatever your message is, I'm going to say amen to that. Even before you tell me what about what it is. That's what a good heart is. So a good heart is when we want what God wants for us more than what we want for ourselves. You get it? Because sometimes when we pray, sometimes when we ask for Yahuwah's guidance, we already have something we want, but we're not prepared to follow what God wants. If what we want and what God wants turns out to be the same, that's good. But if what we want and what God wants is different, then we have to say, this is what I want, but Father, I want what you want more. And so if we have that kind of heart, we have a good heart. Who is the best example of that? Yahushua, right? Not my will, but thy will be done. So if we have that heart, if we are going to obey whatever God has to tell us, even if it means sacrificing your son, which is the message Abraham got, then we have a good heart. Okay, so that's number two. What else? What else is another hindrance uh, that prevents us from hearing from God? Number three is 
the hindrance of irreverence. You know, when we talk about Yahuwah speaking to us, we have to be careful of being irreverent because sometimes we think of God as a friend, which is a good thing because Yahuwah does tell us he kind of treats us as a friend, especially now we belong to our king, Yahusha. But it doesn't mean that we are going to practice irreverence. We have to still keep in mind man is man, God is God. And so we don't call, you know, we don't address him casually, right? I mean, we can speak to him, you know, we call him father, we call him by his name, but we have to be careful not to be irreverent. In the book of Psalms 89, verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those who are around him. So the Bible tells us there are people who are around him in an assembly. When we are around him, when we are among those who have a relationship with our Father Yahuwah, we have to hold him in reverence. We need to understand, yes, we're thankful that Yahuwah God even gives us the privilege of talking to him and him talking to us. I mean, can you imagine that? The creator of the universe speaking to us the creator of the universe minding and caring for us. That's staggering. So we need to keep that. We need to keep remembering who he is. He's God. He's not just some Joe that you come across with. He's not just some president or king. He's God who created all things. And so we need to practice reverence when we are with him. Because once we show irreverence, I don't think your whole God is going to be with us. Because in Leviticus 10, verse 3, it says, And Moses said to Aaron, this is what Jehovah spoke, saying, uh, By those who come near me, right, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. So the Bible tells us, if, we're gonna, if we want God to be near us, we have to regard him as holy. We need to show reverence for him. So if we are expecting to hear a message like in the worship service, for example, we gather together for worship, right? And so we know in worship services, God speaks to us. And so we have a lesson. Sometimes Yahuwah God uses the verses. Sometimes he has a different word for you because all of our cases are different. But he will use that worship service to communicate something to you. He will. Because when we worship together before God, he is there in our midst, and he will give us what we need. And so we have faith that on the day of our worship service, Yahuwah is going to give us a message. But not all of us get a message. Why? It could be because we are not regarding him as holy. We're not showing reverence. So how can we show reverence, for example, when we gather together for worship? Well, one of the things is we need to prepare the place. It could be your room, but prepare the place for worship. We have an example here of a brother, I'm not going to mention the name, but they set up every time they have a gathering, it's just a family, but they set it up and prepare it. So it's nice and decent, right? To kind of show reverence for our father. It's not proper when we're worshiping together or we're doing the worship service and you're eating, right? It's not proper when we are doing the worship service and our cell phones are on. I mean, how would you feel if you're speaking to someone and they have their phone, yeah, on their phone, you're talking to them, right? And they don't even make eye contact. You're on, that person's on the phone. How would you feel? You feel disrespected, right? And so when we are in the worship service, we should be fully focused in worshiping our Father, Yahuwah. So we show reverence because if we don't show reverence, we will not feel his presence. And so if we want Yahuwah to speak to us through his presence, we need to show reverence. And so, yes, Yahuwah God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But there's a difference between omnipresence and manifest presence. Yahuwah is everywhere because wherever you go, he's there. But it doesn't mean that you can, his manifest presence is with everyone. His manifest presence is different from his omnipresence. His manifest presence is when God reveals himself through our senses, and our senses include our sight, our ears, and the sense of our emotion, and the sense of our spirit, okay? 
So we have senses that God gives us by which we can discern things from outside of us. We have emotions, we have senses, we have the, our ears. And so when Yahuwah engages our senses because of his activity, that is the manifest presence of God. And so if we want Yahuwah God to speak to us, we need to show reverence. And one of the ways that we show reverence is based on this question. Judas, not as scared, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And so here, Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, he asks the Lord, how is it that you will manifest your presence, yourself, to us and not to the world? Because the manifest presence of Yahuwah, meaning Yahuwah is opening the lines of communication with us. And so if Yahuwah is going to manifest his presence to us, but not to the world, how is that possible when he's omnipresent? How can we have this manifest presence of Yahuwah? And Yahusha said, take a look. Yahusha answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And so the Bible tells us one of the ways by which we can show reverence is by showing reverence for the commandments of God. Yahusha said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. What is the word that he was speaking of? The commandments of God. And so if we will show reverence for the word of God, Yahuwah and Yahusha will come to us and make our home with us. What does that mean? If Yahuwah and Yahusha will make their home in us, it means they will be able to speak to us and we can hear from them regularly. Isn't this what we want? This is what it means for his manifest presence to be felt in our life. Yahuwah God, Yahusha HaMashiach, is making their presence known in our life so that we can discern their guidance. We can hear from them because they are in us. They're making their home in us. And that makes all the difference in the world. So we show reverence by obeying and showing reverence for the word of God. How also can we show reverence for our father. Yahushua said, in this manner, therefore pray, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know what the word hallowed means? It means show reverence for the name of God. How do you show reverence for the name of God? By hiding the name? No, because when you hide the name, you are causing the name to be desolate. And that's not what Yahuwah wants. He wants his name to be glorified. He wants his name to be exalted. He wants his name to be proclaimed. And so when we hallow Yahuwah, by hallowing his name, we meditate upon the name of Yahuwah. This is why when we pray, we also call upon the name of God to show that we hallow his name, to show reverence for him. And it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? When we call upon the name Yahuwah, call upon the name Yahusha, and we know what it means, this is why we had that worship service lesson last week. When we say we exalt the name Yahuwah, it's not simply done by pronouncing the name, but by understanding what the name means. The name is the character of who God is, unfailing in love, faithful merciful, long-suffering, compassionate, kind, and good, forgiving. That's what Yahuwah means. And so this is what we need to also show, a reverence for the name of our God. Okay, so that's number three. Number four, there's also the hindrance of busyness. How many people here are busy? <laughs> Some people have two jobs. Some people have one job, but they have so many hobbies and activities. They go to the gym. Uh, they have, they watch a lot of TV shows, Netflix, NBA, right? And so a lot of people nowadays are busy. I mean, during the days of the people of God, well, <laughs> they didn't have a lot of distractions, did they? This is why during the days of the 1900s, when you would listen to, when you, you listen to people, you know what their number one hobby was? Do you know what the hobby was of the people in the 1900s? Do you know what the hobby was? 
They only had one hobby, religion. <laughs> that was their hobby. So they were all into it. This is why the sermons last for like four hours. Nowadays, you teach a sermon for four hours, what's going to happen? People are going to tune out. They're not used to that, right? Because people today are busy. People today are distracted. People today have so many things that they want to do. And sometimes when you're so busy, you have no time for who? For God. And this is what the warning is in Romans 13, 11. But make sure that you don't get so absorbed. <laughs> sometimes you're so absorbed with the busyness of life. Isn't that true? And exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day -day obligations. That you lose track of the time and goes off. Oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when he first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. Must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence. In sleeping around and dissipation. In bickering and grabbing everything inside. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger. Waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ. And be up and about. I mean, doesn't that describe the people today? People are running to and fro. So busy. The Bible says they're so absorbed with the things that they have to do day to day. Day to day obligations. If we were to ask you, what are your day to day obligations? You probably can put a list together. And that's very exhausting. When you look at your to-do list, how many here have a to-do list? So... I have a to-do list, you know, these are the things I need to do. And when you look at your to-do list, oh my goodness, it's so exhausting. So you go through your day, day-to-day -day activities, and so exhausted, but in your day-to-day -day activities, the Bible says you become oblivious to God. What does that mean, to become oblivious to God? You're not aware of God. You're not tuned in to God. Why? Because you're distracted. By all of the day-to-day -day things that you have to do. And so the Bible tells us, wake up. What does it mean to wake up? It simply means be connected to God. It simply means listen to what God has to say. Because unless we're awake, we cannot listen to what God has to say. God says, wake up. It's Apostle Paul's way of saying, learn how to listen to what God has to say. Why? Because God is already putting the finishing touches of his work of salvation. In, in other words, salvation is near. Right now, we're very close to salvation. Now that we're very close to salvation, we have, we cannot waste, we can't afford to waste a minute, not even a minute, in doing these frivolous things, in dissipation, bickering, grabbing everything in sight. They're so busy in buying and buying and buying they forget all about the most important thing, thing they cannot buy, and that is our fellowship with God, hearing from God so that he can speak to us and guide us in our life. So brethren, we live in a busy world, and we are busy people. And so when we're busy, we tend to forget God. We become oblivious, oblivious of it. So what does the Bible tell us? If we want to truly hear from God, what do we need to do? James 4, 8 to 10, we read this earlier. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do you see what the Bible is telling us? If we want to hear from God, who must take the initiative? Who does God bring himself near to? The one who brings himself near to God. The Bible says, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. You see, Jehovah God is waiting for people to draw near to him. He's waiting for that. Are we doing that? Or are we running away from God? Or are we so busy doing other things? We don't have time to draw near to God. We need to take the initiative of drawing near to God. Because if not, then Jehovah God is not going to force himself to us. We need to seek him. And when we seek him, we need to seek him with all our heart, right? Why? 
How must we seek God? Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So do we want to hear from God? We have to seek him. Number one. Number two, we need to seek him with faith. Because without faith, we cannot please him. This is why when we endeavor, when we want to begin learning how to listen to God, because he does speak to us, when we do our best to try and listen to him, we have to make the effort. We need to seek him, but we need to do that with faith. In other words, we believe he's going to speak to us. Because if we will approach this, say to ourselves, I wonder if God will speak to me today. Then we are wavering in our faith. We need to be convinced, yeah, who God wants to speak to me? And approach it with faith, he will speak to me. But who is the one who seeks him who will be rewarded? The Bible says the one who diligently seeks him. Take note, the Bible tells us God seeks those who diligently seek him, not those who casually seek him. Because there are those who don't really diligently seek him. They just casually seek him, just for the sake of saying that, why? Well, I, I tried my best. I, I read the Bible. Right? And so, beloved brethren, we have to be careful. We have to put our heart into it because sometimes, you know, when a person is so busy, they have the to do list. And if you have a to do list, you probably can relate to what I have to say. So, you have all this to do list you have your work, you have your kids, you have your health, you go to a gym, you have certain things you want to read. And then you're going to put read the Bible, read Job 21 to 23. You put it on your to-do list, right? Wait a minute. When we put it on our to-do list, are we reading the Bible just so that we can check it off? Or are we reading the Bible because we want to receive something from that we want to hear from him? Are we diligently reading the Bible? There's a big difference. If we read the Bible with faith, we're the expectation that he will speak to us. It becomes different. It's no longer a thing that you have to do. It becomes a thing that you want to do. Do you get it? When you diligently seek the Father, reading the Bible is not what you have to do, but something you want to do. Until you get to that point where you really want to read the Bible, then it's going to be hard for God to speak to us. Okay? So how can we know if you really want to, to hear from God? How can we show God that we diligently want to seek him and learn from him and receive his message? Ephesians 5, 15, 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so how can we show that we are devoted in seeking God? The Bible says we have to learn how to redeem the time. What does it mean to redeem the time? It doesn't mean add more time. We all have the same time allotted to us in a given day. How many hours is that? 24 hours. When the Bible says redeem the time, it doesn't mean you can buy time. And so instead of 24 hours, you now have 28 hours. That's how it works. What does it mean when, we, when it says redeem the time? It means we have to replace redeem the time that we're spending with something else with spending time with God. That's what it means to redeem the time. And so we it's a sacrifice. Instead of doing watching Netflix, maybe I'm going to read the Bible, right? And so we redeem it. We buy the time by taking time away from doing other things. We devote it to seeking God. And so what are the ways that we need to do? We have to be intentional about this is we have to set time for God. And it would be nice if it was a set time, you know, because you want to make an appointment with God. It could be like, it's up to you. When are you most conducive? Because people are more, sometimes people are different. I mean, yeah, people are different. Sometimes for people, their most alert times is morning. Sometimes it's noon. Sometimes there are people who are night owls. And so you can set your time so that when you're most alert, that's when you want to set your time for God. And so you can spend time reading the Bible. This is why we have the reading guide 
the Bible reading uh, plan. And so the purpose of this is to kind of create a pattern, a habit of reading the Bible, right? And not only reading the Bible, but also meditating on scripture. This is why not only do we have the reading plan, we also have our daily meditation. And our daily meditation is in our, it's also on our website. And so the, po the point is we need to set aside time. And as we do so, we study the word of God, meditate on the word of God. However, we have to also be mindful of how we read the word of God so that we can get his message. And so how must we spend time doing the Lord's work and reading the Bible? In the book of Luke 10, 38 to 40, as Yahushua and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at Yahushua's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Yahushua and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you right, that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. So we have here Mark, Mary and Martha who has an encounter with Yahusha in person. We believe that when we read the Bible, we can have an encounter with Yahuwah and Yahusha. Maybe not in person, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so here we have the scenario where Mary and Martha, they were in the presence of the Logos, the very living word of God, right? But one benefits and the other does not. Who's the one who did not really benefit from the presence of Yahushua? Martha. Why did she not benefit? Because she was focused more on the service instead of the presence. Because sometimes we can be so caught up doing the work of the Lord. Don't get me wrong. It's important for us to do the work of the Lord, right? To be busy in doing the work of the Lord. We need to do that. But sometimes we become so busy doing the work of the Lord, we forget about the presence of the Lord. And this is what Mary discovered. Mary says, I mean, Mary, what, what, does she, what is she doing instead of serving? She's just sitting at the feet of Yahushua. She was just enjoying Yahushua. And here's Martha preparing the big dinner. <laughs> and she's focused on the dinner instead of Yahushua. Sometimes we can be like that. For example, we're preparing a place for our worship service. We're planning things for the worship. That's good. But sometimes we can be so focused on the activity, we forget about the activity, who the activity is about. We can be so focused on the details, we forget about the person. And so when we create Bible study time, we need to read the Bible, not as a way of just simply crossing it out from our to-do list, but of meeting the person, meeting Yahuwah, meeting Yahusha. That should motivate us in reading the Bible. Not simply doing the work of reading, but finding the person, finding Yahuwah and Yahusha in our reading. And so when Martha was complaining to Yahusha, Lord, it's not fair. My sister just sits here while I do all the work. Tell her to come and help me. What does Yahusha say? He says, but the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. And what Mary discovered is the enjoyment of being in the presence of Yahusha. And sometimes this enjoyment is taken away from us because we're distracted about what we are actually doing, you know? And so when we are doing things for the Lord, that's good. It's good, we need to do that. But let's not be distracted by the details of what we're doing, we miss out on the person. And so when we study the Bible, that's good. But study the Bible, not so that, not so that you can say, I did this, I, I, was, I completed my to-do list, not so that we can say, I know more than this other person, no, we do it because we want to experience the presence of the Father and the Son in us, talking to us while we, while we read the Bible, okay? And our last hindrance, the hindrance 
of disconnection. We all know sin disconnects us from God, right? But there are people who may not have sin or they, they repented their sins, but they're still kind of disconnected to God. How so? How does that work? Well, I want to ask you a question. How many here? Do you ever turn off your Wi-Fi connection? Sometimes people do turn it off, right? If you're on the airplane, <laughs> when you're on the airplane, they, they tell you to go to airplane mode and you turn off the connection, right? Why? But for the most part, most of the time, we don't turn off our Wi-Fi connection. I ask you what? Why don't you turn off your Wi-Fi connection? Why? Why don't you turn off your Wi-Fi connection? Because somebody might be wanting to message you, right? I mean, what if your friend from the Philippines from long, long ago has a problem or maybe has an invitation to give out to you by email? And so they're sending out the email. They have a message for you. But because you're disconnected, your Wi-Fi is turned off. Do you receive that message? You don't, do you? Right? And so we don't turn off our connection 24-7. It's on so that when we wake up, somebody messages us from a, from a different time zone. When we wake up, we see the email. Oh, somebody messaged me. Because we were connected, right? And so in the same way, we can compartmentalize our relationship with God. You know what that means? When you compartmentalize your relationship with God, it means you only think of God on the day of worship service. You only think of God when you have devotion time, when you study the Bible. And then in the, in the meantime, the, the rest of the 20 hours... You forget them. It's like you're saying, okay, God, I want to hear from you. I want to be connected with you, but only for the worship service time and only for uh, this time here for my, my Bible study. No, we have to be connected 24 7. We need to be aware of his presence. In the book of Psalm 16, 7 to 8, it says, I praise Yahuwah because he guides me. And in the night, my conscience warns me. I am always aware of Yahuwah's presence. He is near and nothing can shake me. So the Bible tells us Yahuwah wants to guide us. David says Yahuwah guides me. How does, when does Yahuwah guide him? 24-7. Yahuwah wants to guide us 24-7. He doesn't want to guide us only twice every one hour of the night, one hour a day. Oh, I want to guide you one hour a day. I want to guide you one day out of the week. The rest of the days, you're on your own. The thing is, Yahuwah wants to guide us all the time. And so if you, you want to receive the guidance of Yahuwah all of the time, David says, I am always aware of Yahuwah's presence. And so in other words, we need to live our life 24-7 with an awareness that Yahuwah is with us, with an awareness of God in our thoughts. In other words, we need to live our life 24-7 with a receptive ear. In other words, we need to keep ourselves connected to Yahuwah, which means at any time we are ready to receive whatever message ha God has to say to us. Because a lot of times Yahuwah God speaks to us when, when we're on the shower. Sometimes he speaks to us right before we get to bed. Sometimes he speaks to us while we're driving. And so if we're always thinking, see, the more we think about God, the more he's going to speak to you. And when we don't think about God, then he's not going to speak to us because we're not aware of his presence. And so 24-7, we have to have a receptive ear. Why? In Thessalonians, it says rejoice always, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Pray without stopping. How many here think when we pray for like an hour, is that a long prayer? That's a long prayer, right? I mean... I don't think I can pray for that long. It's a long prayer. If one, one of these days we have a worship service and I lead the prayer for the congregation and it's like an hour long, what would you say? This is a long prayer. I mean, you, sometimes people complain with a five-minute prayer. <laughs> but the Bible says pray without ceasing. Is that even possible? I mean, how can you pray without ceasing? What is Apostle Paul teaching here? Apostle Paul simply saying, do not be disconnected with Yahuwah. Be aware always of his presence because prayer 
is not a monologue. It is a dialogue. When Yahuwah speaks to us or attempts to speak to us in his still small voice, is that a prayer? Yeah. When we receive something from God, in a way, it's a prayer. Because when we go to God and say to him what we have in our minds, that's a prayer. But prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. And so when the Bible says pray without ceasing, it means opening our ears, being receptive 24-7 for whenever Yahuwah has a message. This is why we have to always maintain that connection. And so we need to always be aware of Yahuwah. Have him all the time in our thoughts. If you're watching TV, you're thinking of him. You're reading a book, you're thinking of him. And sometimes while you're watching a TV show, sometimes he has a message for us through the TV show. It happens. And so we need to always be aware that he is with us and that he is talking to us. That's what it means to walk with God. We sit with God, we walk with God, we live with God by faith, right? Allowing him to speak to us. So God speaks to us without ceasing to. This is why the Bible says in Job 33, 14 and 16, God speaks again and again, again and again, but we don't recognize it. He speaks in dreams and visions of the night when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds. He whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. The Bible tells us he speaks to us again and again from morning till night. Morning, you're awake. He speaks to our ears. When you're about to go to bed, he speaks to us. When you're sleeping, he still speaks to us in dreams and vision. And so he is always speaking to us. But we need to have a discerning ear. We need to be connected and aware of his presence so that we can discern the voice of Yahuwah. So what hinders God speaking to us? Number one, unrepented sin. Number two, an unprepared heart. Number three, irreverence. Number four, busyness. And number five, disconnection. And so, beloved brethren, let us be intentional. And let us be devoted. And let us be dedicated in seeking Yahuwah speaking to us because it would be the greatest thing in our life when we learn the practice of walking with God. Because when that happens, Yahuwah speaks to us constantly, guiding us in everything that we do. And when we think maybe Yahuwah God doesn't want to speak to me. No, he does. You know what proves that? The book of James 4 to 5. We're almost done. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? You know, the spirit that is in us, that is Yahuwah God in us, Yahusha in us through the spirit, right? The Bible tells us the spirit that dwells in us, Yahusha in us, Yahuwah in us. The Bible says the spirit in us yearns jealously. You know, the word yearn, means to long for intensely and consistently. I don't know about you, but you have a spouse, perhaps. Does your spouse yearn for you intensely? Maybe, right? Does she yearn for you consistently? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe there are times when, you know, kind of give you some space, right? But the Yahuwah says, the Bible says, Yahuwah spirit yearns for us jealously. The word yearn means intensely and consistently. Do you know what that means? It simply means God is more passionate about being close to us than we are to him. He wants to reveal himself to us. That's the message of the Bible. This is why he thinks of us all the time. In the final passage of our studies today. Why does Yahuwah want to speak to us all the time? How precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Brethren, Yahuwah God created us for himself. He created you and you me with one thing in mind for him to be an Abba to us he created us because he wants 
that we have a loving relationship with him. And a loving relationship is based upon communication. But with Yahuwah Abba, he is not God who will speak in a thunderous voice, but in a still, small voice. Why? So that we can deepen that relationship with him. Because the best way to really communicate with the Father, spirit to spirit. His spirit and our spirit joined. And when we learn to listen through the spirit, it may not be audible, it may not be thunderingly loud, but when you hear it, it energizes you from the inside out. Beloved brethren, he wants to speak to us. Let him speak to you. Why does he want to speak to us? Because he's always thinking about us. The number of thoughts that he has about us cannot be numbered. Cannot be numbered. It's the Bible's way of saying, you know, it's hyperbole. It's the Bible's way of saying, Yahuwah loves you that much. He thinks about you all the time and he speaks to you all the time. Let Yahuwah speak to us, brethren. And let him guide our life. Because he's preparing a special place for each and every one of us. That is our lesson. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting Father, Yahuwah Abba, hallowed be your name. How awesome is that name. Because of your name, which means your character, because of your faithfulness, long-suffering, you have opened the door by which we can have fellowship with you through your Son, manifested by the Spirit. Abba, Yahuwah, we long to hear from you. When you see your people doing our best to diligently seek you with faith, from heaven, send your spirit. Speak to us. We long to hear from you. If in the past we tuned you out, if in the past we ignored you, forgive us, Abba. Forgive us, please. And help us to repent from all our sins and to create pathways to you. Help us to understand you better, deeper through your spirit, communicating to our spirit. Yahushua, our King, may you please dwell in our hearts. Make it your home that we might find guidance through you, teaching us by your spirit. May you stand by our side. May you be in our midst. Remember everyone here tonight, those who have gathered in your precious name. We seek you out. Please, we ask humbly, replenish and restore us. Heal us of all and any sicknesses and grant us the presence of the Father through you in our midst. Father, thank you for listening to our prayers, for always being there for us. Though we do not deserve you, we cannot deny you love us so much. You think of us all the time. Please, Father, connect with us. We will do our best to initiate that with you. When you see us drawing near to you, may you come to us that we can find peace, find joy in your presence. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, thank you for attending our Bible study for today. Just a reminder, our new schedule, if you miss this one and you're catching a recording, just take note that our Bible study schedule for this uh, week and for the foreseeable future is the following schedule. BQA, the Logos, the HP, same days, but different uh, time schedule, 7 p.m. PST or 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Also this coming weekend, we have our children's ministry Friday and Saturday. Uh, for Friday, it is for our Far East audience, 11.30 p.m., uh, Saturday is for our Western audience, 11.30 a.m. Also, this coming Saturday, we have uh, like a meeting. We have a special meeting of all Assembly of Yahusha brethren who are in the Philippines. Okay, so if you live in the Philippines, we want to connect with you and we kind of want to organize our the Philippine, the, the, the AOI brethren.
who live in the Philippines, where we can kind of get to know each other and kind of create some plans and goals for our brethren there in the Philippines. So this is for Saturday, January 13th at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which means in the Philippines, it's not Saturday. It's Sunday at 9 a.m. Manila time. Zoom ID, 827-4948-1031. Okay, 827-4948-1031. This is the same Zoom ID for the meet and greet. And lastly, let's check out our new website, aoy.today. When you type aoy.today on the search bar, it will take you to our website. You can scroll down, you can look at the tabs and see what we have to offer. Uh, that is all. And may Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha Hamashiach bless all of us.